On September the 2nd, 1666, there was a great fire in London. It began in a baker's oven. You can actually work out the exact location of that baker's oven if you go to what's called the Monument in East London. On the top of the Monument, there are uh, bronze flames coated in gold leaf. And if you could take that monument and lie it down, it's the exact distance from where the baker's oven was that originally started the fire. And it caused tremendous damage. 200,000 people lost their homes because most houses were timber framed in those days. Did 10 million pounds of the damage, even in their money. And altogether, 90 churches were destroyed many of them rebuilt by Christopher Wren, including St. Paul's Cathedral afterwards. Now, of course, when there's a disaster, it's one of the unfortunate sides of human nature that you look round for a scapegoat, someone to blame, Lockerbie disaster. Anyway, people are wanting to find someone who they can blame for it and will search for someone. And often the innocent are accused. And in the case of the Great Fire of London the French Catholics became the scapegoat and they were blamed for having set London on fire. Now, on July the 19th, in the year 64 AD, the city of Rome burnt down. And again, there was widespread devastation. It burned for three days and then it died down and then the wind changed and blew it up again and there was a second great fire and most of the center of Rome, many temples, many houses were destroyed. The same thing happened. They looked for a scapegoat. Only this time, they began to blame the Roman Emperor Nero. They knew he had ambitions to pull down all these buildings and put up new magnificent structures. And so they said, ah, Nero started all this. He got somebody to light the fire. Well, Nero wasn't having any of that, so he looked round for another scapegoat. And this time the Christians got it. And that really marked the outbreak of serious persecution of Christians to the point of martyrdom. And it was triggered off by that great fire of Rome. They were tortured. They were sewn into the skins of wild beasts and made to crawl round the theatres on all fours while they were set upon by lions and other wild animals. They were hunted by dogs. They were crucified. I remember standing with my back to the Colosseum and looking at a low green hill next to the Colosseum in Rome, which is Nero's palace garden. And I thought of the day when he held a barbecue party in that garden and he took the Christians and he coated them with tar and bitumen and then he tied them to posts around the garden and set them on fire while they were still alive to provide fairy lights for his barbecue party. And a shock wave went through the whole empire from church to church when they heard about it. And with that shock wave went a little letter from a man called Peter to get people ready for the shock wave of persecution that he knew would spread. Peter himself was to die in that shockwave. He was to be crucified. As Jesus had predicted, fancy living for 30 years knowing that you'll die by crucifixion. That's not a very pleasant thing to have at the back of your mind. When he came to be crucified in Rome during that Neronic persecution, he requested especially that the cross be inserted in the socket in the rock upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be the same way up as Jesus. And he wrote this little letter we're going to read now or look at now. And he wrote it to the Christians with whom he had a special connection and interest in what we call now Turkey, northwest Turkey. He obviously had been ministering in that area. Paul had ministered in southern Turkey, but Peter seems to have gone to northern Turkey Way in that northern area, he writes to them and he says, get ready, you're going to suffer. And therefore, in a sense, 1 Peter is really for Christians who are suffering. It's relevant everywhere. Christians are fearful and wondering what's going to happen now, as in fact they are in many, many parts of the world.
And the surprise is he doesn't tell them how to escape it, but how to endure it. Not how to get out of it, but how to stay in it for Jesus and how to conduct themselves when it comes. How to live in an increasingly hostile world, an increasingly anti-Christian society. Well, it's very relevant for us because persecution has now broken out in this country. It's no bigger than the tip of an iceberg as yet. But if at the next election we swing to the left, it's going to increase. I'm not making that a political statement. In other countries, the anti-Christians are on the right wing of politics. In our country, they happen to be on the left. And I believe we are going to have much greater battles in the future, not least over such things as the Sex Discrimination Act and both the question of homosexuality in the church and the question of male and female elders. It will be under the Race Discrimination Act because it's now considered an offense either to criticize another religion or even to say that your religion is better than any other. And so we are facing an increasing pressure on Christians. So it hasn't reached yet nearly the degree that it was going to reach when Peter wrote this letter. Now the writer, we know a lot about him. Great favorite is Peter, and his letter is a favorite letter too. Uh, Christians love to study 1 Peter. It's a warm, human letter that really touches your heart and it really comes across. You know when he speaks in the first chapter to Christians and says, even though you haven't seen Jesus, you love him and you have an unspeakable joy in doing so. Well, that touches your heart. It's a beautiful letter. This impulsive man with foot and mouth disease, as we said earlier, always opening his mouth and putting his foot in it. But that did mean that he did open his mouth from time to time and was the first to say wonderful things about Jesus. What else do we know about him? His first name was Simon or Simeon or Simon, which means a reed. Fancy calling your son a reed. Almost like calling him weedy. But Jesus, when he met him, said, I don't like that name. I'm going to give you another name, Rock. And that's something of what happened to this impetuous man. When Jesus found him, he could be easily swayed like a reed in the wind. But when Jesus left him, he was solid rock. I suppose the most moving occasion was after he denied him three times and then met him on the shores of Galilee after the resurrection. And uh, some bishops need to know that Jesus fried fish after his resurrection. <laughs> that was real enough. And Jesus cooked breakfast for the disciples. And there was Peter. And suddenly Peter found himself looking into a charcoal fire. Now there are only two charcoal fires in the whole New Testament actually mentioned. One was in the courtyard of the high priest when Peter was warming his hands over the fire and a little girl said, uh, you're a friend of Jesus, aren't you? No, no. But you've got the same dialect from up north. Oh, well, a lot of us have. But I've seen you with him. I swear I don't know the man. And as he said that, Jesus was led through the courtyard. It broke Peter's heart. Now he's looking at a charcoal fire again. It must have brought it all back. And Jesus said, Peter, I rather hoped you'd be the first pastor, but I'm afraid now you'll just have to give out the hymn books. Is that what he said? <laughs> it's the kind of thing we say. No, he said, Peter, I'm going to put you on probation for a year and see if you've pulled your socks up. And, and after a year, we'll review your case and reconsider your position. Did he say that? No. You know what he said? He said, Peter... I can cope with you, provided I'm sure of one thing. Do you love me? Do you love me? So Peter emphasizes that in his letter. He says, though you haven't seen him as I have, yet you love him. That's the most important thing that's going to matter in the future to you. Do you love him? 